you all for being here with us tonight. This has been a highly requested topic, um, and we are so grateful to all the parents that reached out, um, specific, specifically Lisa Bowers, who had said, you know, it would be great when preparing for her daughter's surgery if I could, you know, know what to pack and hear from other people and connect with other moms. And she'd been doing that a lot of it on her own, but through that conversation, we were like, let's make this happen. And also, I think our mom's happy hour, um, this was suggested. So just thank you to everybody that suggests ideas for CCA. We really take those to heart and try to make them happen. Um, so I definitely want to introduce our panelists. And But right now, I want to just go over quickly what um, this webinar is. It is a for moms, for parents, for families, by mostly moms and one patient. But we don't want it to exclusively, we don't want anybody to feel excluded. If you have something to type in the comments or share in our Q&A suggestions and tips, please, as an audience, feel free to share that as well. We all know that this is a pivotal moment in your family's life. And this webinar is going to feature our parents who have experienced the red. Um, they will all be individualized experiences, but you can glean from their tips. Um, and then of course, we'll open it up for questions and concerns from the audience. And I definitely want to make sure everyone knows this is for informational and educational purposes only. Um, we are all, we, none of us um, are working in a medically staffed capacity at this moment. And we are definitely not here to diagnose or treat any illnesses or conditions. Um, nobody here can offer specific medical advice for your family, but everyone here is encouraged to share from their own experience and definitely reach out to your team. And if you need to find a team, you can reach out to CCA to get some direction on that. And please understand that the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed here in these panels belong solely to the speakers and not necessarily to Children's Craniofacial Association, schools, employers, organizations, or committees that are represented herein. So that is my big legalese disclaimer. And now I would like to introduce our panel. So first up is Stacy Atkins. Stacy is the mother of three daughters. Raven, who is a doctor of chiro a chiropractic, or chiropractor, excuse me. Macy, who is a cheerleader, who is an 11th grader. And Allison, who is 12 in seventh grade and a baton twirler. Macy has Pfeiffer syndrome and she had the red when she was five years old. Stacy herself is a registered nurse and she is an office navigator for a Medicare Advantage insurance company and a long-term acute care nurse. So we do have medical people on here, but they are not acting in their medical duties tonight. So thank you, Stacy, for being here. Then we have Lisa. Lisa is a mom of three from Cypress, Texas. Her children are Christopher, 19, and twins, Ashley and Jessica, who are 16. Ashley was born with Apert syndrome and had the red with Dr. Fearon at age six. They have been attending CCA retreats since Ashley was one years old. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Lisa. Next, we have, we do not have Stephanie with us here tonight, but we do have Liz Cox. Liz is an advocate, maker, and plant mother from Springfield, Massachusetts. She lives there with her partner, Jason, and their awesome kid, Nova, who is 11 and has Pfeiffer syndrome, and a 17-month-old golden doodle, who is adorable, named Trudy, who rules the roost. Nova had their Lafort 3 with red in the winter of 2019-2020, which led to their tracheotomy being removed after 11 years with it. When she's not working advocating for and supporting families in the public health systems, she can be found cooking, playing in the dirt, or going on long drives looking for good food with her family. So thank you, Liz. We have Emerald. Emerald is representing our patient group of folks tonight. And Emerald is a 25-year-old living in Cleveland, Ohio. She's an IT project coordinator that enjoys reading and working on her home garden in her free time. She has Cruzon syndrome and her halo, now called a red, um, was done when she was about eight years old. Thank you, Emerald. Laurel Sanborn is also here with us and Laurel lives in Richmond, Vermont with her husband, Mark and their children. They are the parents of two daughters and two sons, Amelia who's married and in college in Idaho, Olivia who's 18 with Pfeiffer syndrome and Zachary and Samuel who are seven and five. 
Laurel works at Vermont Family Network as a family support consultant, which gives her an opportunity every day to help families navigate systems and the care of their children with special needs. She values the mission of CCA and the support her family has received in so many ways in the last 16 years. In her spare time, she enjoys watching the activities of her children, family history, and being outside and traveling. Thank you, Laurel, for being here. Then we have Heather Sutton. Heather Sutton lives in Utah with her husband and three daughters, Samantha, Haley, and Charlotte. Haley has Apert syndrome and is 11 years old. Haley had her red done in 2016 at Seattle Children's Hospital under the care of Dr. Richard A. Hopper. Dr. Hopper pioneered a method for doing the red, which helps normalize the facial ratio, ratios of children with Apert syndrome. We utilized all of our support people, including those at CCA and Ronald McDonald House, to help Haley and her family get through the red as smoothly as possible. So thank you, Heather, for being here. And our last person on the list, but certainly not least, is Courtney Vasaki. Courtney lives in Aurora, Colorado with her son, Shane, and her husband, Sean. Shane had red the red in 2017 at seven years old. His care is through the Cranio team at Rady Children's in San Diego, California. Courtney serves on our board of directors at CCA and also enjoys anything outdoors, running, hiking, swimming, et cetera. So thank you everyone for being here. And we will just go, I have my little list here. So I'll mark folks off as they give us their answers. But if you would just um, chime in when I call on you and some of you said this in your bio, but just tell us, you know, remind us your child's name, how long ago the red um, surgery happened and where you got care and whether that's local to you or if you had to travel to do that. So if I could start off with Heather, could you tell us a little bit about those questions? Sure. Uh, my daughter is Haley and she had the RRED in 2016, summer of 2016. She was, she had her birthday with um, the device on she turned seven that year and we traveled from Utah to Seattle to have the surgery after researching lots of options. And um, what was the third question on that slide? Uh, I think you got them all. Where, oh. when, and did you have to travel? <laughs> okay, there you go. Awesome. All right, Laurel, would you tell us um, about your experience? Sure. My daughter is Olivia. Um, she was six when she had the uh, red halo on. Um, we did travel from Vermont uh, to Texas for her care. Um, it was just about this time of year that she had it on 12 years ago. So it's been a while. She's 18 now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Stacy. what about you? My daughter is Macy. Um, she had the red when she was six years old. So that was about 13 years ago. She's 18 now. Um, we traveled from Zachary, Louisiana to Dallas, Texas. Dr. Jeffrey Firon was the doctor who um, did her red at Medical City Dallas Hospital. Thank you so much. Awesome. You're welcome. <laughs> Liz, what about you? Hi, so my child is Nova. Nova's um, 11 now, and they had the red when they were 10. It was last winter. We had the red removed right before everything shut down due to COVID, so perfect timing to get that device off. Um, we are in Springfield, Massachusetts, and we are treated at Boston Children's Hospital, so we were able to stay, I mean, 90 miles, so local by traveling for craniofacial care standards. Um, but still a few hours in the car in Boston traffic. Definitely, definitely. I think you have one of the most recent um, surgeries here. So yes, thank you. Um, Lisa. Hi, my daughter is Ashley. She's 16 now, but she had the red at six for breathing issues. Um, we traveled from Houston to Dallas with Dr. Fearon. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Courtney? Hi, yeah. Um, so my son is Shane. He had his red as well as internal distractors at the same time, uh, which I think is a little different. Um, that is something that uh, Rady Children's Dr. Amanda Cosman 
um, will do in some instances. Uh, we were local at the time. Uh, we lived in San Diego at the time. We now live in Aurora, Colorado, but we have maintained care. So we travel now, but we did not travel during um, the time where Shane had the red device on. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Emerald, will you tell us about your experience? Yeah. So um, I got the Halo when I was about eight. So that was, gosh, like, 18 years ago, I think, if I'm doing that math right. Um, I live in Cleveland, well, a suburb of Cleveland, and my care team was at the Cleveland Clinic, so I didn't have to travel more than 20 minutes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, that sounds like we have a really good mix, um, so I look forward to kind of diving into the experiences that everyone had. Okay, so we're gonna go into a deeper dive now. Um, and I'm gonna put these questions on the screen just so we can see, so you guys can see some things that we're gonna be talking about. And I'll kind of, again, go round robin. I know that some of you are willing to talk on these things. So first up, I want to talk to someone who had the, the surgery a little bit earlier. So Stacy, I'd love to ask you, what contributed to your decision to do the timing? Cause I believe you said uh, Macy was five. That's correct. She was five year, years old. I remember Dr. Firon giving us an anticipated time or maybe around seven or eight when, you know, she was a little bit older. He would um, watch and see how the face grew. Macy had major breathing issue, probably as a lot of the kids. Um, her nights were very restless. Um, she woke up crying all during the night. She could not breathe. We tried um, CPAP. Um, she couldn't tolerate it. It wouldn't work. And I was like, hey, can we revisit? Um, they were talking about tracking her again. She was able to get it out when she was little with a surgery. Um, I said, what about the mid-face surgery? You know, is it too early? Can we do that? Um, so he looked at it or whatever and, and thought that was the best option. Um, and it, it changed our lives after the surgery. So it was very scary that she got it done so early, but it worked. It was life changing. Awesome. Thank you for that perspective. Um, Liz, I think you said that um, Nova's a little older. So would you add on there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so much like Stacy just talked about breathing issues being as common as they are. I mean, Nova was trached at 16 days old and had a fabulous stable airway. We didn't have any issues with the trach. Um, so our team was really pretty comfortable holding off on the mid phase um, to try to let Nova grow as much as they could so that there would be less guesswork with how far to pull things out. Um, and Nova was perfectly content growing up with their appearance. There were no concerns on their part with regards to wanting to change things. We had the stable airway. So we were all pretty comfortable just holding tight um, until everybody was on the same page. Nova was really the one that made the call and decided when they were ready. And um, hoping for decannulation or that trach reversal was really the key motivator for them. And I have to say that when they presented it to their team, the team listened to all of Nova's reasons behind it, talked to us to see, you know, if we had any concerns as parents and um, really respected Nova's um, desire to move forward in this method. I was um, not sure how that conversation was gonna go and how much weight they were really gonna give a 10 year old choice in this matter, but Nova's always been incredibly active in their own healthcare, has always gone into every appointment with their own questions and like really has stayed on top of things even from a very, very young age. Um, so when they went in with their questions and asked how feasible it would be for um, them to move forward with that and what it would look like and you know, the maxifacial surgeon said, well, you know, if you had your way, when would you wanna do this? And Nova looked at him and said, um, well, April's bad for me. This was in March. Um, 
But ideally, I think November would be okay, because I don't want to miss out on summer vacation. And they were able to schedule it for that November. So um, we were really lucky that they took Nova's needs into consideration at that point and really how they wanted to move forward with things. But it was all driven by that kid. Thank you so much. I think that's a really good segue because I was going to ask Emerald, do you remember kind of the the age and the timing? And I love that we're, we're moving into more child directed surgery planning. What was that experience like for you, Emerald? So I don't remember, but I talked to my mom about it before this. And um, I, I was kind of, it, it was not optional for me to get the surgery. So it was kind of I needed to do it, so it was done. Um, but my parents tried to um, s tell me how much better it would be after getting the surgery, trying to prepare me, explain what it's for, and you know, like what good I would get out of it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think this is a really important topic, and so I'm going to, you know, get a few more folks in on this one, if that's okay. Heather, I know you said you had been willing to answer on this, too. Sure. We um, experienced the same breathing concerns with Haley and had sleep studies throughout, and essentially um, the the sleep study prior to her RED was not looking so good lots of obstructions every night. And, um, you know, we, we worried about oxygen to the brain, honestly, making sure she was getting the air she needed to thrive and to grow. So, yep, that's what, that's what got us there. Thank you. I think I want to ask a little bit of a follow-up and maybe Laurel, you can jump in here. So when you're, when you're looking at these sleep studies and these, um, these not sleeping well through the night, trouble breathing, what are those key indicators you're looking for? I think they've been mentioned, but maybe we'd be kind of explicit. Those key indicators that let you know intervention. Well, well our, our situation was kind of a combination of all of these. Um, uh, you know, many Pfeiffer children have tracheostomies as has been stated. Um, we didn't end up with one early on um, and our surgeon thought that um, she would have a really early mid phase, like he was talking three at the beginning. And, um, you know, we were propping her up at night to sleep and that kind of thing. We, we started having the sleep studies. Um, I think Stacy had mentioned, we tried the um, CPAP and things. She just screamed and her heart rate went out of control. Uh, we tried the tennis ball that he wanted us to do with the pajamas, you know? Um, and so um, interestingly enough, at first he thought it was going to be a, a at three, and then um, as we kept doing our annual appointments, he said, well, we, you know, we, we may be able to get to eight, which is um, kind of, he, what, what, what our surgeon does is try not to have a second surgery, a second jaw surgery, but uh, he figured that she's probably was gonna have one anyway. So we were actually the ones that advocated, um, you know, uh, for her to have the surgery at six, um, because, we knew that there was gonna, which we're preparing now for a second jaw surgery, hopefully her final surgery um, at 18 uh, to move forward again. Um, so we felt like, uh, again, I think uh, Heather was mentioning her heart was racing there, you know, every time she gasped to breathe kind of thing. And so we were concerned about the long-term effects of that. And so um, we advocated and uh, he was actually very agreeable and listened um, I think Stacy might have paved the way for that. Thank you, Stacy. Um, but but yeah, I, I think that there are, and I think in each individual case, it's going to be different. You know, where whereas Liz said um, there was a trach that the airway was stable, and um, that makes a lot of sense too to to have the child more in on the the uh, situation and the decision making. Perfect, perfect, Lisa. What do you um, what do you want to add on this? Our situation was a little different. Our sleep studies were coming out okay. Like our doctor wasn't worried about them, but I was sent, posting messages of Ashley's videos sleeping and she was like struggling to breathe. Um, you could see her whole body moving up and down with each breath and she was waking up all the time. So I sent our surgeon a video of that and he's like, oh, okay, yes, we can go ahead and move along with the mid face. So. It was a little different. Also, um, I guess I also wanted to say 
now that my daughter was six, I've, and it's been what, I guess she's almost 17. So September, 2010, um, I've been watching the different ages of the kids at what age they have the mid face done. And my observation, I'm not saying everyone has this case, but it was, it seemed to be easier for her at six emotionally than it is for the older kids. I've noticed they've gotten depressed the older they are. Like, I'm not saying all of them. I don't think Nova had this problem, but I know I saw a few of the kids that did get pretty depressed with the mid face with the red on. So that's it. Yeah, no, I think this is a good, a really good transition kind of to the next question too, which is how did you prepare yourself, your child and your family um, for this? And that definitely, I'm sure that goes into the timing, but what did your preparation look like? And Lisa, if you want to just jump right in there, feel free. Okay. My thing was, I was able to see a few of the kids with the device on in person, which helped a lot. And Ashley also, um, it and seeing pictures, but seeing your kid after surgery, still it's different when it's your kid and you walk in that room. Um, Ashley also had like three emergency blood transfusions in the, in the OR, she's got some kind of blood clotting issue. And um, so they were in there for an extra long time and she was extra bruised and extra swollen, which I wasn't expecting, but she, she seemed okay with it. I mean, she was six. And I think she's emotionally a little behind, but she had seen her friends with the red on. I think we were even with Olivia when she got it off or something. Cause she, she was with Olivia with the red on. So she saw her running around and playing like a normal kid. So she was like, Oh, that's not too bad. So she did okay with it. And she actually gained weight too, while she had the red on the first two weeks, she wouldn't eat anything. And we were threatening her to put the NG tube back in, but she um, finally started eating and actually gained weight. So that worked out good for us. Good, good. Thank you. Um, Courtney, what about you? What, what did your pep preparation look like in your house? Yeah. Um, so we, so Shane, Shane was seven um, and he did actually help prepare himself, I guess. Um, we were super fortunate that one of the families that we had become close with through CCA retreats had gone through the red um, the year prior, which helped start the conversation about, um, you know, this is what they would like to do next. Um, you know, how do you feel about that? Um, and that that child had, um, a, you know, a pretty good experience with it, came to the retreat, you know, everything. So, um lots of FaceTimes with them. And so, you know, Shane could ask questions. Um, we did, Shane loves to see his x-rays. Um, so we, we went through the x-rays and we said like, this is what's going to change. And so we kind of like drew, um, you know, what it would potentially look like. And then he took those x-rays to school and he told all of his classmates about what was going to happen to him. And he did miss out on summer vacation because we opted to go through summer vacation for that. Um, oh, look, there's his x-rays. This is what he brings to school. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so I think that helped too. Like Shane, Shane, like Nova is very, um, into advocating for himself and he comes to every appointment with a list of questions and really has done that since he was four maybe. Um, and so we talked about it a lot and it, it was always, it, I mean, he needed to have it done, but we tried to make it feel like it was his decision as much as we could. And I think that really helped the, um, the transition, which was not easy, right? Like, like Lisa was saying, when it happens to your kid and then you wake up the next day and you're like, oh, what did we do? Um, but, you know, they're, they're stronger than we are. So, uh, it, you know, it, it all worked out in the end. Thank you. Does anyone have any tips for preparing siblings um, specifically? I'm just going to look at our panel here. And yeah, Lisa. When I told Jessica that I was going to do this, Jessica's my daughter's twin. Um, she said that she thought that she was going to catch the red after Ashley came home. She was like, and I noticed in the pictures that she was telling the truth because every picture she took with Ashley, she would 
back off like a foot away like she wouldn't hug her closely like she was scared and she said she was scared she was going to catch it so that might be something you want to talk about usually my kids are really jealous of Ashley when she would come home from surgery because she would get a balloon and a blanket and they would be so jealous that she got mommy time the whole time it was kind of frustrating because you know she just had a really major surgery but um seeing her after the red with that device on was a wake up call for them. And they were super nice giving her their PlayStation at the time. That was Christopher's cold toy. She, he's like, here, Ashley, you can play with this anytime you want. So it was kind of neat for that surgery. They were like extra nice and sweet to her. Yeah, that is cool. Um, Laurel, uh, I noticed you want to jump in on this, please. Yeah, just, you know, uh, a uh, big challenge we've had is there's a distance from Vermont to Texas. Um, and many of the surgeries and appointments we do, we, we did take our older daughter, but this was one in particular that we felt it wasn't the right place for her to be. Um, but what we tried to do is involve her every step of the way, um, you know, getting her to see the other uh, kiddos with the device on, you know, seeing pictures. Uh, we did, we were fortunate that we had a friend uh, fairly locally that just before that, that we could meet up with um, that had it done. But the other thing that we did is, um, um, and it might be long in your further questions, but I'll answer it now. So we, um, the girls both, we helped Olivia pick out uh, little gifts, you know, dollar store type gifts for every day that um, we were going to be in Dallas. And then we had a respite provider at the time who was actually working with Amelia. It was a special program who went with her and picked out a gift for Olivia for every day that uh, we were going to be gone. They wrapped their gifts for each other. We took the gifts to Texas. You know, Amelia had them here with her grandma. And then every day um, they would we would Skype back before, you know, Zoom and all this stuff. And um, they would open the gifts together. And um, I have to tell you funny that that the first time that Olivia laughed after the red was when her sister um, opened the whoopee cushion and sat on it that Olivia had bought for her. Um, so that was just a really good way to keep her connected with everything that was going on. So and, you know, some people know our family. Uh, my daughter's married and in college and we had our annual appointments a couple of weeks ago and she just couldn't miss out. It's been such a part of her growing up that she wanted to come to the appointments with us. So it's it really, and I've told people over the years, oftentimes I worry about the emotional piece for my other daughter more than I do. You know, Olivia is living this. She's very strong, very straightforward about everything, like many of the kids we've talked about, but I worry about her sister often or have over the years. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a really, really sweet idea. I like that. Um, I want to jump to Emerald. Um, please tell us what you have uh, to share here. Yeah, so um, I have three older siblings, but my uh, closest sister, I can very distinctly remember her um, coming to one of the appointments where they kind of mocked up what my face would look like. So it was um, a a drawing a sketch of what it could be and I remember her saying like oh you're gonna look like you're gonna look like Dakota Fanning you're gonna look so pretty and like that was um a big motivator for me just to know like my sister thinks this is cool so I should probably do it and um I know she got very protective with me um so you know always wanting to protect me from other kids so maybe finding some way to take that responsibility off the older siblings, say like, they're going to handle it. You don't have to always stick up for them. I mean, it's great to have a protective older sister, but I feel like she had a lot of pressure put on her that she gave to herself to um, protect me from other kids or from just the world. Yeah, thank you so much for that insight. I really appreciate that. Um, and then I just want to jump to Heather because you added something in our comments and I'm not sure everyone can see that, but this goes back to kind of looking for the signs and then feel free to answer on the, the preparation as well. Sure. So my, my comment, I just failed to mention that um, Haley did sleep with oxygen with a cannula for the first seven years of her life. And um, really within just a few weeks of the RED surgery, she um, was able to sleep just so peacefully and her heart rate went down 30 beats per minute during the night consistently and she stopped wetting the bed. So that was a 
a really amazing benefit. It was so fun to see the oxygen truck drive away with all those supplies and things and just wave goodbye forever. That was nice. So, um, and then as far as preparing Haley and my family in general, I have a, a daughter that's older than Haley and a daughter that's younger. And we opted to utilize all of our family support to take the kids with us on to Seattle. So they went with us to initial appointments and um, we kind of did it all as a family, which was a little bit crazy, but I have um, seven older sisters and each of them and my parents all took a turn with us in Seattle for the month that we were there during surgery and um, just devoted some time to helping with, with the family, which was amazing. And not everybody has that, but it worked well for us. Um, we, we did at, like, we have a lot of neighbors who wanted to help as well. And I asked them all to kind of, I don't know if this is, I, I don't know how people feel about this, but I asked them to provide, if they were going to give a prize to Haley, I asked them to provide one for the other two girls too because that was a hard thing for my kids always. Um, and so the neighbors were great with that and family. Um, and another tool that we've used over the years to prepare for surgeries is um, YouTube videos. Actually, there aren't that many out there, but some families have posted videos of their kids going through the RED and photos of their um, journey. And that was really helpful to my whole family to watch those videos and prepare mentally for what, um, what might be coming. And then also um, when we went to Seattle for, um, for pre-op, we met with a child life specialist there and I sent her a list in advance of things that were concerning to us and to Haley and that might be triggers for her, um, autism issues and things. And they really, she, she has come and met with us at every single appointment we've had the same child life specialist and Haley is like her best buddy now. And, um, she, she helped Haley prepare and just feel comfortable with the hospital and the staff in general. Um, so that, that made it nice. Thank you. Thank you. I think you're, you just summed up a lot of really great things about utilizing the resources that you have, that your team has, your family has, your community has. So thank you for, for all of those um, tips. I do want to move into our next question and I'll do this again round robin. So I'll just, I'll just call on you. And if you need to pass, pass. But um, my next question is, if you could sum it up in one sentence, what is the one thing you would have wished or you wish you would have known going in before the surgery. So what is that one thing you wish you would have known? And um, I'll start with Stacy if I can. Um, I would say school and eating. I didn't realize that she was gonna have to be homebound. We, our plans was to send her back to school. Um, but then we didn't realize she was gonna have an AG tube as well. She just would not tolerate anything by mouth. So I, I didn't, wasn't prepared for that. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. What about you, Liz? It's a tricky one to sensitively say. Um, there is a lot of trauma that goes with this procedure. And there can be a lot of secretions and discharge after the factor that I was not fully prepared just to manage overnight the first like two to three nights of staying on top of that, even while we were in the hospital. And it wasn't until a nurse after the factor who had been through this multiple times with many other kids was like, yeah, 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 that's totally normal. Don't panic. Um, excessive nasal secretions and oral secretions are going to happen. And with that level of disruption, they will not be the standard ones that you are used to seeing. Um, so I was not fully prepared for that all the way. Um, I think other than that, we were really lucky that we had been able to see so many of our friends go through this massive life change. Um, almost to the point where like, 
when you talk about how do you prepare your kiddo for it, my kid was looking forward to it because it's like it was like a coming of age in the craniofacial community where we would like go to retreats and they'd be like, Nova, when are you going to get your red? And Nova would be like, I'm going to wait another year or two. It was like, OK. Um, but of all the tips and tricks we picked up, somehow we missed that one. So um, it, that one was the one thing I think that really threw me off. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Courtney, what about you? Yeah, that, so very similar to what Liz said, wound care, right? I think the thing I was not prepared for was this surgery is not one and done, and then you go through the recovery, and then you go home, and life goes back to normal. Um, wound care is the entire four-ish, you know, however many months that the, the device is on, um, and it's painful, and it sucks, and your kid doesn't want you to do it and you have to be the monster that makes them do it um and shane had internals and externals at the same time so not only were we turning the external device which he really tolerated very well but those internals are very different and you know he got to the point where like he didn't want us to turn those he was fine if we turned the red um and, you know, not only did he have the screws, you know, for the red, but he also had the internals, which are constantly um, oozing and get looking gross. And like the wound care was, uh, we were not prepared for that. Mm, it's like thanks. Groundhog's Day all over again. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, that's, I mean, who would have known? So thanks. you. Thank you both for being so honest and candid. Um, Laurel, what about you? What would you uh, wanted to have known? Yeah, I would definitely echo uh, what you've both, what Courtney and uh, Liz have said. The secretions, you know, I know af after us, folks that have gone to the same center that we have, they did a lot more suctioning and things with the drainage. But uh, if you look at pictures of Olivia, there's bloody, scabby, all kinds of crap coming out her nose and her mouth. Um, and just that whole piece um, of what Courtney was talking about. For me, it was, um, I was so focused on my fear of this surgery that all I could focus on at one time was getting through the surgical piece. Right. And so I, I couldn't think about the recovery afterwards. And even with that, I wasn't prepared for how just you sit and wait, you know, those first few days, um, you're, you're, you don't know exactly how your child is going to react to this surgery. You know, there's many different scenarios, but, but I, I feel like, now I would go back and, you know, be a little bit easier on myself. Just, you know, like it just seemed like, a, it, you know, we, when we have a cranial vault, we go into the hospital, we might stay a night in the PICU. We go a day to the floor, we wash the hair and we go home and we just have to keep an eye on the incision, wash their hair with baby shampoo and pretty much done. Not the same with the red. So, or, or, or a distraction device. So that was for me was definitely, a, and that's what I tell parents, you know, um, we were there five days. I know a lot of people are there longer and that was for feeding for us. We had to have the NG tube pulled because she wouldn't eat with it in. Um, but, uh, so, so even those five days where I was very impatient until she started eating, you know, we have a history of throwing everything up for several days. So, but yeah, just that whole, it's not the same as other surgeries that our kids tend to have. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Lisa, is there a piece that you'd like to share? Yes, I was not aware of the drool. Before we had lots of drool, but with that red on, it was unbelievable. So a good idea I've been telling people is to bring cloth diapers, so it's constant wiping. Um, another thing I wasn't prepared for was how fast the face changes. You hear your child and you turn around and it's not your child. It's moot. Their face goes forward so quickly. It's really hard to get used to that. And then you see an old picture and you're like devastated because you miss your child's face, but you're really happy with the new one because they can breathe. Um, also, once we got it off, I, I did not realize that her mouth was swell so bad that it swallowed all of her teeth. We went to go eat and I freaked out because I couldn't see her teeth anywhere. Thankfully, the next day they came back, but it was kind of shocking to see. Um, what else was I going to say? Also, what was great for us is the red fixed the constant runny nose and the constant drooling for us. So 
That was a nice thing too. And the breathing. Chewing was a little difficult afterwards because the teeth didn't line up again, but hopefully we're going to fix that soon. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like more secretions during, but less after <laughs> to sum it up. Um, Heather, do you want to, to add what you wish you would have known? Sure. I think for me, the, or for us, the most difficult piece was caring for Haley's teeth. Um, I described it at least with her specific, um, RED. She had like a splint under her teeth and then it was connected through her gums with wires all throughout, like probably six wires on the top to keep the splint in place. And it, I described it to, to people as trying to clean her teeth through a, the door of a jail cell with the door shut, you know, you're trying with a Q-tip, you're using like any tool you can to just try and get in there. She loved to eat. And so I couldn't stop her from eating mac and cheese and rice. And, you know, everything is just getting stuck between the splint and the roof of her mouth and those wires. And she hated having the water pick done. It was torture. Um, I would have worked with her on the water pick in advance for sure, but caring for teeth was an issue for us. So, Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And Emerald, is there anything you would add that you wish um, you would have known as a patient or, or advice for others? Um, no, no advice that I would like to have, but, um, I'd just like to reiterate, hopefully all of you parents know already, but it's so much harder on you than the child. I, like, I have some, like, I have some memories of nightmares from the drugs that were awful, but like, my mom had to sit there and hear about my nightmares. So that was probably worse on her. And I remember the really bad smell of like blood and bacitracin, but that's it. That's all I remember. So it's probably a whole lot worse on you guys, which I don't know if that makes you feel better or not, but <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that's good. a good reminder because we definitely, you know, our audience who's listening, we have talked about some of the hard parts up front. But I do want to ask now, what was there an easier part? I like to call this the roses and thorns. We've definitely, we've definitely gotten stuck by some of these thorns, but what, what was easier or better or what, you know, made it worth it during, not necessarily after, because we all know the why, but, but what was better or easier during the experience? And you can raise your hands or I can, I can start. Um, Courtney, do you have anything to add on this one? Yeah, so I think once we got past the first, once we got past the turning piece and we were in the sort of just reconciliation and we don't have to turn anymore, but we're just letting everything settle. Um, all of a sudden, like my kid was back uh, and he wanted to do everything that he did before he got the red on. Um, and maybe we did, you know, I think you have pictures you can show people later. We, we allowed him to pretty much do everything he want he wanted to do um except for jump on the trampoline um <laughs> but you you will see later um we let him go swimming we let him ride the log ride and several other rides um at disneyland he rode his bike um the surgeon was not necessarily happy about that but um, he wanted to be a normal kid and who are we to stand in the way of him being a normal kid? So I think we wanted to baby him the entire time it was on. And once we were done turning the, the, all the different screws, he was like, mm, nope, I'm, I'm done with this. Like we're, we're gonna go back to being normal. Thank you, thank you. Does anybody else have a part that was easier that they would like to share? Oh man. <laughs> I would, I would, I would, um, you know, so ours wasn't as much activities, but it was a very hard decision for us, but our daughter actually ended up going to school. Um, she was two weeks out two weeks for the surgery and recovery. Um, and in our mind, that was the best thing ever for her. Um, she was in kindergarten. And, uh, like you said, Shane was as soon as she felt better, she wanted to get back to everything that she had done before. Um, 
she doesn't typically have a one-on-one, -on -one, but the school provided one for safety for her, you know, to kind of keep the kids, um, you know, not right on top of her. And for eating in the cafeteria, they had someone with her to make sure she didn't choke and help her clean her mouth out and things like that. Um, and then uh, for us, it was important for those kids that she's with all the time to see her, you know, what, what the reality is for her. And um, what we did is she got it on in April and then she finished school with it on. Um, and we, we actually, there was a CCA retreat in, in um, Texas that year. So we coordinated around the retreat. So she got it off the day before the retreat started. Um, but then when we came back home, um, before school started again in the fall, we live in a very small community. Uh, we got together with everyone at the park and um, you know, we made a picture with, the, with uh, uh, her having the red on, they all signed it and, and it was a lot more comfortable going back to school in the fall. But um, I know that's a big decision. Even our surgeon was questioning a little, but she didn't end up having to have the NG tube and um, we do it all over again in our case. Thank you, thank you. Emerald, you can jump in on this. Yeah, so I did not go to school with mine and um, it was, I don't know, I feel like I missed out not going to school, but um, all of the kids went on like a camping trip and that probably would not have been good for um, a kid with a halo to go on. But um, I did go to like the park at the end of my street and I remember um, that the kids didn't understand what the halo was. And unlike um, Nova, I was very soft-spoken. I didn't stand up for myself or anything, but um, the kids were like, oh, you look like you have a birdcage on your head. And I'm like, well, it's not a birdcage. And they're like, okay, cool. <laughs> and like, it was no big deal. Like they didn't understand what it was, but whatever, we still played anyways. So I do wish that um, I would have been able to speak up for myself and tell them what it was, but I don't feel like it was a limiting factor for me to play with the other kids. That's really good insight. Yeah, and I think that goes to some of that preparation too, that, you know, there's there's more and there's less, but thank you for sharing that, that insight a lot. Um, I do have some questions that our audience had submitted that I would I would like to work in there and feel free to kind of work in your answers to these questions as, oh, this was better or this was unexpected. Um, but I know that there's been a lot of talk of dental care and um, I believe it was me, maybe not. No, I think it was Liz. Liz, you said that you um, could speak to when you did orthodontics, um, the timing of that. Yeah. So um, like I said, Nova was older when they had their red and a lot of it was like that delicate dance around timing and what did we need to do? And like so many of our kids, there was some significant orthodonture that needed to happen. Um, we needed to expand the palate. We needed to pull some teeth to make room for permanent teeth to come in. And so working that into the plan with the red and how that was going to make sense because Nova um, was a little bit older, but their mouth was still so crowded. You know, we waited on doing the red. One of the reasons why we waited was we didn't want to damage permanent teeth buds because the way that um, our center uses um, the attachment is it's actually attached to the um, maxilla, um, to the upper portion of the jaw. So it's not like wired in, it's not an oral splint, like it's actually above the teeth. And they're worried once the kids get to be a certain age, if there's permanent teeth buds or roots in the way that it can cause damage. And so there was that delicate dance of like, put on the braces, get the teeth down, expand the palate, get permanent teeth out of the way, and then we can attach the red. So we actually went through the red with um, the palate expander in um, and braces on. We were really lucky that our craniofacial team also has an orthodontist. And like I said, they're just on the other side of the state from us. And we're in Massachusetts. So our state is not that big. You can drive across the state to go to the orthodontist. It's not always super fun, but you can do it. Um, so we've been able to do all of our standard orthodontists through our craniofacial team which has been super helpful to make sure everybody was on the same page in the planning process, that they were comfortable with what was gonna go on with the palette and the braces beforehand and leaving it on. I don't know that if I was going to like 
the orthodontist down the street from me, that our craniofacial team would have been quite as comfortable with them managing that aspect of it while we had on the red and doing things like that. I will say that there was a pause and they didn't do any, um, there was no expansion when the red was on, that was all done and we were at a retaining stage um, and they didn't change any of the wires on the braces during the whole time that Nova had the red on. Um, but other than that, we were able to go through that whole process without um, disrupting that orthodonture. Um, so when the red came off, we were able to not go right back in because it was right as COVID was hitting um, and things were shutting down. So we weren't able to make it in for our standard like wire changes to keep things moving. Oh, there they are with it. Um, but it was a pretty quick progression right after the factor to be able to move through. And I'm glad that we didn't have to wait until after the red came off to be able to start any of that process. Um, because Nova would have been significantly older by the time we were even able to get started. Perfect. Yeah, I wanted to share this picture because you can see some of the, the braces and everything reflected here. So thank you for that. I think one question that I have neglected to ask is what is the timeline? So you get it on, you do turning, you wear it, and then you take it off. What, um, especially for maybe some of our more recent surgeries, what is that exact breakdown of time that you are, you're going through this? So we got the red put on a week before Thanksgiving. Um, it was November 20th of 2019 and January 28th, we were able to um, take it off. We had, um, I want to say we turned for about four and a half weeks. So it was, I mean, we turned for a long time to keep things moving. And then um, we, we moved horizontally and vertically. Um, so we were moving on multiple planes. And so there was some time where we stopped turning in one direction and we started turning in a different direction um, to see how things were gonna pull. They really, um, I'll say I was really surprised because I was expecting like a concrete, like fast, like when we were prepping for this and I was like, how long is it going to be? And they're like, well, we'll see. And I'm like, that's not really how I operate. Um, I would really prefer to know, like, so we can plan this out. And um, I wasn't prepared for what a fine art it was going to be to really get things in like that sweet spot where they didn't want to overcorrect too much, but they wanted to compensate for that sort of fallback that was going to happen. Because a lot of kids have this settling after the red comes off. Um, but they also didn't want to over pull things too much because they didn't want to go from one extreme to the next, which made perfect sense to me, um, especially on somebody who was older where they weren't going to like grow into it quite as much as if it was done on somebody five or six or seven years younger. Um, but we turned for like four and a half weeks and then we kept it on for another four weeks um, before it was removed. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Courtney, can you add to that too? Cause I think this is, this is really one of those need to know questions. Yeah. So we, um, they actually planned for 20 weeks. We were able to get it off, um, in 19, we turned for four and a half weeks and then they let it settle for the remainder of the time. Um, and so I think we were a little, we were a lot longer, uh, it was on a lot longer than some of the other families that we had talked to. Um, and I, I don't know if that was due to the fact that it was internal and external at the same time, um, or they did a pretty significant amount of overcorrection um, for Shane, uh, at which unfortunately he recessed, he's recessed a lot. We're going through the um, orthodontia work right now to try to recover um, some expansion, but it looks like he'll probably have to have a second surgery when he's in high school. So, um, you know, that, uh, the, the timeline, right. It's a fine art and they don't always get it right. Uh, and so there's no way to know what's going to happen in the future. Um, so I think you just kind of have to be prepared because you know, every, every kid is different. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I want to jump now to speaking of turning, um, uh, maybe Stacy, you had a younger child. What did you do to do comfort? How did you comfort during this time? Um, and what are some things that helped soothe and make it a little bit less stressful and traumatic? Um, the turning was actually the easiest part 
for us. I mean, it was um, anticipating it and just the idea of you turning a screw in your child's head was kind of scary, but it was actually pretty easy. We, we had a certain time of day. Uh, we would normally take a picture at that time. Um, she loves pictures, you know, that till this day. <laughs> so we would take a picture during that time and it was, we would just turn it. It was just a, you know, itty little bit. So it didn't bother her. Um, it was never painful. Um, I remember one time the halo, the screw getting loose and it was loose. That was very scary. Um, so I remember we had to call the doctor and see what to do to tighten it back. Like we had to be a mechanic for this thing. <laughs> it wasn't the screw we was turning, but something came loose or whatever, but it wasn't bad. We would just sit down at the table, the same spot, the same time every day and turn the, um, screw for her and Macy was prepared with a, a doll the doll was gave to us by child life and it was very cute and it was made with like the um what do you call it pipe cleaner and they had some little clamps to the side of the doll's head and she still has that doll and Macy called her halo the U because it was shaped like a U and she called it her U but that's that's about it for us Thank you, thank you. Laurel, what about you? What did you do for some soothing and comfort techniques? Um, you know, Olivia was six and um, fortunately she really, you know, it's one of those questions you keep asking, does anything hurt? Is it, you know, is it hurting? Um, particularly when we started turning the screws and um, you know, Dr. Fearon did it the first few times and um, Mark and I maybe did it once each and then from then she did it herself um you know we for, we're fortunate that she didn't have to um she so you all can probably relate to this somewhat it, our kids have a lot of stuff that's out of their control um so for olivia what she can have control of you know if you talk to the picky nurses olivia will take the iv out with some guidance herself you know she's very um and she's like that to this day which we really wouldn't have in any other way but yeah the red fortunately was a fairly painless thing for Olivia once. I mean, within a couple of days, she was on just Tylenol. Um, and she, part of that is she has some pretty negative reactions to, um, oh, there she is. Oh. Um, sorry, like Lisa said, this is the time, you know, I don't, it doesn't phase me when I'm looking at her because I'm so happy with how well she's doing. But when I look at these pictures, they really take me back. Um, yeah, so we were very fortunate that um, uh, for that particular piece of it, there were, there were no, issues for Olivia and she was in control. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Anybody else have any just kind of comfort and soothing they want to add in here? I don't wanna miss anyone. Okay, perfect. Oh, Emerald, yeah. Yeah, so um, my parents gave me an American Girl doll for, um, because I always wanted one and I mean, I don't know. I've, I always wanted one. They were like, okay, when you get your halo, when you wake up, we're going to have your American Girl doll. So it was kind of um, a little bribe, <laughs> but I, I was so happy to get that doll that it was kind of like payment for what I had to go through. <laughs> <laughs> understood, understood. So we have about 10 minutes left um, and there's so many more questions that I think I had, but one that we get over and over and over is what do you either take with you to the hospital or what do you have waiting at home um, that's gonna make this process easier? And again, if you have something you want to add, just raise your hand um, because I know this lots of people ask and it may seem obvious, but for everybody who submitted this question, what tool would work? And I think that Liz, you also agreed to answer this one. So I'll start with you. <laughs> okay. Um, so we, we deal with extra fusions. So Nova's got fused cervical vertebrae as well as fused elbows. And so things like eating and staying hydrated are always a huge concern. And Nova was adamant that they did not want to have a feeding tube unless they absolutely needed one. So we had that discussion in advance and like what would need to happen in order to avoid that. And, you know, if we needed to intervene, it was going to be okay. But we really know it was really important to know that that, that not happened in advance. Um, so, so this was the best tool that we had. Like we're lucky our little, um, 
our little cat played hockey before the red. There was no hockey during the red. Um, so we had some of these around and we brought them with us to the hospital. And the awesome part about the long straw sports bottles is the straw is super duper long. So if you're dealing with any additional fusions, you don't have to worry about getting it super close to your mouth. Like um, we tried like all the hair dye bottles and like condiment bottles, um, but you had to get them too close and um, you had to squeeze really hard and you couldn't really control the same way. And we found that with the sports drink bottles with the super long straws, they've got like just the right amount of pressure that you can squeeze them or they can be squeezed from down low and you can really control the flow um, and the speed that liquid goes in because that takes a whole different length of time to adjust to how to swallow and process things, at least it did for us. Um, and spoons, the right spoons to be able to get those little minced up and super soft bites actually around all of those awesome oral apparatuses that you're dealing with into a place where you can swallow. Um, we had huge success with munchkin toddler spoons. They might've been baby spoons, but they were the long handled plastic, like really small bowl, um, like not wide at all, really narrow. You could get around things and just sort of like flip them upside down before they um, were at a point where they could turn them. So those were huge. Um, and I know other folks have got a lot of like really great pro tips that we stole from. So I'm gonna let them share some of them. <laughs> Definitely. Heather, I know you were talking about the water pick afterwards. Is there anything you'd like to add for hospital or during? Yeah. So a water pick is essential. At least it was for us. Um, that's one thing that I've realized as we've been talking, I think that each surgeon has kind of a different way of attaching the RED in the mouth. And so, um, Haley's splint might've looked a lot different than others. Um, but for us, we used dental all the orthodontic picks you could find, you know, the, the little flossers and um, a water pick. And um, it would have been nice to practice in advance, like I mentioned, um, Q-tips, Neosporin, um, hydrogen peroxide. Those were things that we had. And actually those first few days we used like just a a really large syringe for feeding in the hospital. Um, but yeah, overall, those are similar, similar thoughts as Liz mentioned. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, Courtney, what about you? What, I, what I'm learning is that Shane's surgeon does everything differently. Um, his was not anchored in the mouth at all. He had nothing in his mouth. It um, was actually anchored through the nose. Um, so it was still attached to the upper jaw, but it went through the two nasal cavities. So um, he was fortunate enough to, once the pain subsided, he went, he resumed eating everything. Um, we also have a, I have an uncle who's an engineer for Raytheon, who you can see he's wearing his glasses. They CBC machined a glasses attachment um, for it because Shane can't see without his glasses. And because they anchored through the nose, he really couldn't wear his glasses either. Um, I do have the schematics if anybody has a CBC machine and would like to make their own. Um, but what, <laughs> what I would say is um, similar to the water pick and Heather, you wanting to have like worked with it beforehand, ours, our thing was mouthwash. We realized Shane had never experienced mouthwash before this. Um, it did not occur to us to have, you know, our small child use mouthwash. Um, I wish that we had done that before because the mouthwash they give you is gross. Um, and so, uh, but the thing that we um, discovered that was our magical item was if you think back to like the seventies, it's the pillow with the arms and they're hideous and like corduroy. Um, and so we were fortunate enough that I have um, a grandparent who had one and they let us borrow it. And then um, friends of ours who are seamstresses made all these really cool covers out of um, fabrics that had superheroes and Pokemon and whatever on them. Um, but that pillow, because you know they, they, they can't sleep on their side, like the sleeping is an issue. Um, so he used, and he still to this day uses that darn pillow, even now when he's playing uh, his video games, it's a little beat up now, but um, 
I don't even know if you can still get them. Maybe they're on Amazon, but that pillow was the coolest thing and was so helpful for everything. Well, if they're not they're I'm sure they're going to make a comeback because everything that is old is new and here now. So, <laughs> um, yeah, Emerald, you, you want to add your, uh, tool to the list. Yeah. So, uh, Courtney, I know the pillow. I love the pillow. <laughs> um, so that's a good thing, but, um, it's fairly obvious, but just in case anyone didn't think of it, button up t-shirts, gotta have them. You can't put them over. Um, I, even if a neck hole was big enough to be put over, I didn't want anyone to do it. So um, get a lot of button up t-shirts or, you know, like things that you slide up or something like that. Perfect, perfect, Stacy. So that's what I was going to say. The uh, button down shirts are very hard to find. Um, so I remember searching everyone where preparing for it. So you will need button down t-shirts. Um, and I was a little crafty back then. So I may, may see some um, pajamas that tied um, in the back, like a hospital gown, all you know, different patterns. Dora, she loved. Um, I made those. And I was going to say we used the boppy pillow. So if you can't find the corduroy, just the baby bop, and that's what she slept on, and it worked well. Yeah, thank you. We did have a question from the audience about bathing or showering. Did you have to make any adjustments to that? Um, Lisa, we haven't heard from you in a minute, so I'll call on you. Can I backtrack a minute? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Actually able to sleep on her face. It was the weirdest thing, but it was nice because it propped her up so she could breathe and she wasn't smothering, but she slept on her side on her face. It didn't bother her at all. Um, she also could not really eat by mouth at all. And she had, she couldn't close her mouth or suck. She had to lay down and put like a towel under her mouth and squeeze the hair dye bottle back to her, the back of her mouth so she could swallow. Otherwise it would just come pouring back out. And that was pretty much the whole time and except for Halloween, she tried to eat a Whopper and choked on it. And that was pretty scary, but that was the first time she tried to eat food was a Whopper candy. So um, what else was I gonna say? What, what, what was your question after that? Sorry. Oh, bathing and showering. Did you make any adjustments? Oh yeah, no, she, I think after, the, week, the first week was really rough, but the second week, once once she started eating at the end of the second week, she started feeling okay. And he, our surgeon was okay with her. I'm pretty sure swimming in the pool and bathing and showering, everything was pretty much normal at that point, as long as we did wound care afterwards. So I have advice on that. Um, make sure they help you do that the first time before you leave the hospital to get all the goop out of the hair and uh, make sure they're really nice and clean the first time. That was helpful for us. I would not have wanted, even though they braided her hair and did all this stuff, I would not have wanted to deal with that um, as well. I just had a couple other things. Um, uh, depending on the age of your child, Olivia was six, so she was she was old for bibs, but we really needed it. Um, we started out with, you know, they have like Sesame Street and she got tired of that quick because she was six. Um, so we went to the Pampers disposable bibs, which she could do herself and uh, just toss those when she was done eating or if she was drooling excessively. Um, we did the same with the mouthwash. There's something called biotin that is a lot milder than mouthwash and it just kind of cleans your mouth and gives you um, a nice, and it, it kind of, uh, my husband takes it for snoring. It puts moisture so that you're not all dried out. Um, and the other thing, which is way out there, but because we traveled, um, I wish I had known to bring like a fanny pack or a small uh, backpack to put the tools in. Um, it was kind of ironic that, it was so funny, you know, this was after 9-11, um, but we um, we didn't get questioned at all. We put, we so we put the tools in our care, our, um, our um, checked baggage, which we shouldn't have done in hindsight, you know, what if we needed them to do in an emergency situation to cut a wire or something. Um, but uh, they didn't even, 
they didn't check that at all, you know, but then they gave us grief because we had these kid essential shakes that were liquid and they couldn't open them up and inspect them. So they threw those all away um, when we were going back to get it off. But yeah, I think a fanny pack to carry the tools and any essentials around that you're going to need, uh, especially those first few weeks moving out and about in the community would have been helpful to know. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I do want to kind of move to our, our last little bit of wrap up. I want to show you guys prepared so much and I thank you so much. You all sent photos. So I want to share your photos. And as you're, um, we go through, they're just, you know, in a random order, as we go through the photos, if you would just share one piece of encouragement um, for the families watching tonight and that will watch in the future, um, because everything you all have said has been so helpful. Um, but I want to just leave on a positive, encouraging notes for the parents out there, like Emerald said, who it's probably harder on, um, what advice would you give there? So let me just pull up who is here first. I believe we have Shane's x-ray up first. So Courtney, you'll be up first. If you just, I'll go through your photos and yeah, just, just offer what you can to our families. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's probably the biggest takeaway, right, is is it is much harder on the parents than it is on the kids. They're so resilient. They're so adaptable. But don't do it alone, right? Like, you have to have another parent or multiple parents. Find someone in, on Instagram or Facebook or through CCA or, like, you have to have somebody that at 2 a.m. when you think you're going to lose your mind and you're crying hysterically because you just can't do it anymore, like we've all been there and there's through CCA, there's hundreds of parents that you can connect with. There's lots of dads out there because I think this panel is all moms, right? We're all, but there are lots of dads out there. I will volunteer my husband. Um, he does it all the time as well. Like don't do it alone. You don't have to. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, next we have Stacy. Okay. I'm going to, I'll say the same thing. Make sure you have a buddy, another parent or someone um, that's been through it before that can guide you along with it. Um, they, they, it is not painful for the child. So just remember that, um, try to think about the end results, um, their breathing and things like that. Um, and just stay, stay encouraged. You're going to get through this and any one of us parents would help you um, through it just to be a support. It's very helpful. I had a parent, a buddy all this whole time before, during and afterwards, and it was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Emerald, you're next. So uh, I'm just going to say pretty much the same thing other people are saying. This is all I knew with my life. I didn't know uh, quote unquote normal life, this, this is it. And it's like, you, you get through it. So um, don't, don't worry about your kids. I mean, obviously worry about your kids, <laughs> um, but don't think that their life is going to be bad or ruined because of this. Because I mean, I'm 25, I'm super happy. I'm, feel successful in my life. So honestly, it's like, it's going to work out. It's going to. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, Laurel. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you, Emerald, first of all, that is so wonderful. You know, uh, one of the big things for me is like what everybody else was saying is, um, you know, I, I had a pal whose child was about the same age, but I also uh, had a family uh, of a child who was much older and who had been through the whole thing. Um, so uh, that was that was key. So thank you for sharing your experiences. And I and I feel like that. I feel like um, all these uh, kids that I've met and these young adults and adults just just uh, radiate are strong and have a wonderful life. And and I feel like that about about my daughter, um, you know, take it easy on yourself. Um, this is a big one, um, but uh, it's it's um, it's doable, and you have so many uh, people to support you, as folks have said uh, over the years. I know my daughter doesn't remember a lot about it, but I know that when she um, talks to younger kids, she's very she's honest, and um, we we wanted folks to be honest with us. And, and I think the beauty is everybody has a different experience. Uh, to share, but somehow we all get through it together. Perfect, thank you, thank you. Lisa. Yes, what everyone said here, use your support group 
anyone in any of our Facebook pages, CCA, whatever, all of us have been there for each other, sharing experiences, and it's made a huge difference. Um, Ashley, you can see she was little when we she had hers, but she, I mean, it made a huge difference in breathing and drool, like I said before, and the constant runny nose went away. So it was, I miss her sweet little face, but <laughs> she, she, she just heard me say that. Um, but I mean, all of these kids, if you go to any CCA retreats, they're all running around, they're super happy. Um, they're amazing little kids and big kids now. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Heather. Um, so a couple things to keep in mind during the RED and throughout the whole process, I felt like it was Haley's moment in the spotlight on Facebook and throughout um, the internet. So milk it for whatever it's worth, you know, if you want to um, raise awareness for CCA, it's the perfect time for that. And um, we received so much love from so many people, Build-A-Bear gift certificates and care packages and um, just little video clips that people sent wishing well. So just enjoy the fame that you get from this surgery for a few minutes. And then also um, because of this, this surgery and all the surgeries, Haley is so much better able to empathize with others and care for others. Um, just recently, this past week, actually, I had to go to the hospital and I was kind of upset, not feeling well. And I said, Haley, I need you to pack me a bag for the hospital. And she knew exactly what to grab. She helped grab my slippers, my pajamas, my toothbrush. Um, and she checked up on me throughout the whole process. Anyway, I'm doing well now, obviously had a stomach issue, but she um, learned so much about how to care for others through this process. Thank you so much for sharing that. Liz. I mean, the downside of going at the end of this, right, is that I don't know that I have anything novel to add um, because everything that everybody has said is so, so true. Our kids um, are so strong and will handle this no matter how hard it is and how much it sucks and how many bad moments and bad days they have with such grace and poise in ways that I can't even wrap my brain around. Um, because if it were me, I would probably still be on the couch requesting narcotics. Um, the, how fast they bounce back is incredible. And um, how fast you see them come through as, as who they are and who they have always been, um, despite all that is happening and all they're going through is just, um, is just awesome. Heather, I love that you talk about like leaning into that, right? And I feel like so often it's our nature to sort of pull back or minimize. Um, but with something like this, the majority of the people in our lives have no frame of reference and have no scope of what this really is um, and what this means to our kids. And we just tried to make it a celebration and look where we're going and look where you've come from and, and look what is in front of you with it. And we did countdown chains. We asked friends to write on pieces of paper, little notes and every day, we pulled a link off of that chain and it was, it was a note from somebody who cared about Nova and we got to read it. And there were some days where that was like the highlight of the day was reading that note from a friend. Um, so there's, there's no wrong way to get through it. Whatever works for your family is exactly what you should be doing whether it's something that anybody on here or on Facebook or on Instagram or through a support group has said or not, if it works for your family, it's exactly what you should be doing. And that's the beauty of going in, at the end because that, that is so perfect. Thank you for saying that. Um, and we, we wanna encourage everyone who is 
listening, um, reach out to CCA. We offer not only financial assistance, we will hook you up with these panel members who have graciously agreed to share some of their contact information. We'll do it offline for privacy reasons, but if you or any member of your family, sibling, grandparent, um, dad, anyone is having a hard time grappling with this, reach out to us and we have these amazing people who are so willing to share their stories and share their lives. Um, with others to just help you get through it. So I wanna especially thank our panelists for all the hard work and preparation that you put into this. And um, I believe that we got so much out of this and there's a million more things we could share, but this was our inaugural webinar. So thank you for all being my test subjects and having so much patience as we got it going. Um, everyone, I just want you to know what a big impact you're having for, for the whole future. I get a little emotional about it, but I really appreciate all your words and your honesty. And I look forward to doing this again on another topic. Um, but please, audience members, reach out to CCA website, Facebook. We'll, we'll hook you up with these great um, parents here and patients who have, who have offered their ongoing support. So with that, I'm going to say good night. And thank you again. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And you're getting some love in the comments. So I'll let you enjoy that for one second. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.